All right. It's great to be here with you this morning. Um, it's kind of a weird Sunday for me, um, telling you about my defining moment. It's not like a regular message that you can structure and have three points, you know, that everybody can walk home with. Um, I actually have no idea how long this is going to take, um, but trust me, it won't be longer than an hour and a half. <laughs> defining moments. And then the, the, the song just now, I will follow you anywhere, anywhere you go, but not that far. It's kind of, it's kind of the, the story of my life. Um, it has to do with control. How much control are we willing to give up? How much control do we want to keep in our lives? But before we go there, I want to talk ab about defining moments a little bit. And I, uh, I, my favorite thing to do before messages is just Googling the topic and see what comes up. And so I, I Googled defining moments, and you find all kinds of very interesting, valuable, credible information on the Internet, don't you? Um, so I want to share uh, some of that with you. Um, so I found a, uh, a top 10 list of defining moments in history as it comes to the first 10 years of this new millennium. So from 2000 till 2010, these are 10 defining moments, and they categorize them, or they have 10 different categories. Um, so I'll start with 10 and, and go down to one, all right? Will you count down with me? Here's number. Yeah. That's right. Literature. The defining moment in literature was the completion, apparently, of the Harry Potter series in 2007, <laughs> which, if you think about it, it really has, the Harry Potter series has really changed literature. I mean, whenever have people lined up hours, an all-nighter or at midnight in front of a bookstore, especially kids, <laughs> to read a book, right? I mean, it's kind of crazy, but it's happened. Number? Nine. Very good. You're keeping track. Television is what they put at number nine, and what changed the defining moment of television is the emergence or the appearance of reality TV. And isn't that true? Hasn't that changed television and a lot of our lives and DVR habits and what we record and whatnot and so on? Reality TV. Then comes number eight. eight. Their category for number eight, and they, they did this in importance, um, as they saw fit, was movies. And they said the movie that changed movies in this last decade was Slumdog Millionaire. Anybody see it, saw it? Great movie. Um, I don't know if it's a defining moment in Hollywood. I don't know. Well, Bollywood, I guess. But all right, now after number eight comes number seven. And this category is sports, which I think is highly underrated. That should be way higher in that list. <laughs> Um, but they said the defining sports moment of the first decade was the Boston Red Sox finally winning a World Series in 2004. Now, here you can tell that this list has a definite U.S. American twist. Um, but anyway, uh, number six, sorry, number six is next. Um, music is the category, and what they put in here as the defining moment in music is the, the introduction of iPods in 2001. After number six comes number... Five, this category is technology, and I couldn't agree more with this. It's Facebook appearing in 2004, changed technology, and was the defining moment in technology in the last 10 years. Number four, economy. And they picked not the, the economy that went south, but the introduction of the euro uh, as a currency in Europe, and I couldn't agree more. It was horrible. <laughs> changed everything, made everything twice as expensive. After number four comes three. three, international affairs is their category. And I'm surprised that this isn't higher because they chose the September 11th as a defining moment, which obviously it has been. It, it changed the way we look at national and international security and, and all of that. And then number two, nature. They, they picked the tsunami in 2004 as a defining moment. of, And how shocking was that? We, we would have never thought something like that would be possible, did we? And then number one, and please, I, we, don't, we don't need approval or disapproval of this one. They picked politics and the election of Barack Obama as president of the United States in 2008 as the most defining moment in politics and the most defining moment of the last 10 years. So there's defining moments in history, right? And in different eras, there's different defining moments that, that change things from then on forward. And then, obviously, there's, there's personal, personally defining moments, and, and that's what we've been talking about these last few weeks. The first, um, I, I love movies. Anybody with me? Love movies? 
So I often think of, of when I talk about topics and messages, of, wow, what movie would be a great illustration? And a movie that came to mind right away when I thought about defining moments was the movie Signs. Has anybody seen Signs with Mel Gibson and Joaquin and Phoenix before he went crazy? Um, and they have this moment where they're sitting on the couch, all this crazy st stuff is happening, and they talk about, do you really believe there is a God? And, and Mel Gibson in his character didn't. He was very disillusioned with life and very disappointed. And Joaquin Phoenix, his, his brother in this movie, said, oh no, there's a God. And he said, really? What makes you think that? And he tells this defining moment when he knew there was a God. He was sitting on a couch. He was at a party where there had been a lot of drinking. And, and he was approaching this girl that he had a crush on. And, and uh, they were about to start making out when he realized he had a chewing gum in his mouth. And, and said, so, oh, no, i got to take care of that. And he took the chewing gum out, and right at that moment, she threw up all over the floor. And he said, that's when I knew there is a God. Because <laughs> had I not had a chewing gum in my mouth, I would have gotten messy. So defining, this was his defining moment. I hope <laughs> that your defining moment is more substantial than that. I hope that your spiritual defining moment, if you've had it, is more substantial than that. Mine is. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about this morning. And it, like I said earlier, it has to do with, with control, having control or at least the appearance or feeling of, of control in your life. And um, my family and I, we lived in Sweden for two years before we, we moved back to Germany. And this was from 98 to 2000. I was teaching at an American Bible college there. And part of our program to the students but also to the Swedish community was that we had a high ropes course on the premises there. Anybody ever been on a high ropes course where you're, what is it, 30 feet above the ground? Ours was about 30 feet up in the, in the trees, and there were the craziest uh, things you had to do up there, like balance on a, on a beam that was about three inches wide. And, and obviously, you have a harness, and you're secured, and you have these carabiners and, and these ropes that, you're, that you keep you secure. But I will tell you, I, it was part of my job during the summers was to take uh, youth groups through that and camps. But we also had business uh, groups come from, from businesses who wanted to learn more about teamwork and, and you know, going out on a limb and taking risks. And so we would take them through this ropes course and, and teach them certain lessons. And I will tell you, I've never seen more grown men weep like children uh, when they were standing up there and they had to, had to do the leap of faith where they had to up there at 30 feet, jump and, and catch a trapeze and swing over to a platform. Uh, it was crazy. And what we would do with them, we would, we would show them the, the ropes you know, that you use for climbing and these kind of things. And, and we would show them the literature on them and say, hey, these are certified to carry whatever, three tons of weight. Do you believe that? And they were like, mm, yeah. really? Mm, yeah, I believe it. Okay, and this carabiner that you, you're hooked up with, it says it, it carries three and a half tons of weight. Do you believe that? Yeah. Okay, then jump. Nothing's going to happen. It's going to carry you. Oh, I, I can't. And it was this, the, the biggest thing when we debriefed with these people was the, the loss of control. They knew, yes, this is trustworthy. This will carry me. Even if I don't make it across, I'll, the worst thing that's going to happen is I'm going to hang here, you know, and then they're going to pull me back up. But they couldn't do it. Often some did, some didn't. But the ones that couldn't just couldn't give up that control. And that's what my life was like for a long time, spiritually. Knowing, I always knew there was a God. I always trusted that He was good and that He had a purpose for me. But I couldn't quite get myself to give up control to Him and, and trust Him. I grew up in a, in a very untypical family for, for Germany. Both my parents were, were devoted followers of Jesus. Um, they, they loved him, they served him, they raised us knowing him. Both my parents, uh, parents, so both my sets of grandparents were devoted followers of Jesus. All of my uncles, cousins went to church, which in Germany is literally unheard of. Only 2% of the German population go to church. All right? It's crazy, and this is the country where Luther came from, but that's another story. Um, so very, very unusual. Um, so I grew up going to church all my life, since I could walk, and before. Um, all my memories growing up is, is going to church. A lot of, most of our social life took place in that context. And let me tell you a little bit about that church. You think K2 is kind of a crazy church. Maybe you know, if you're visiting here, we play weird music, and, and we don't dress up, and, and so on. But 
the church I grew up in for the first 12 years of my life, it's called the Brethren Church. And uh, they don't have a pastor. It's all led by lay people. And when you come into the auditorium, there's two sections. And one section is for women. The other section is for men. And they sit separately. Women aren't allowed to, to pray out loud or to say anything, really. They can sing. And men are the ones that speak and read out of Scripture and pray out loud and suggest songs to sing. And it was pretty wild. Now, that's why I grew up. My grandfather was one of the leaders there. And, and they love Jesus, just have a different interpretation of Scripture in certain parts. So I don't want to put it down, but let me tell you, it was kind of weird. Especially going back there now, you know, that I'm a pastor here and I go back and I go to church with my mom. It's a little odd for me, but um, that's, that's the kind of church I grew up in. And even though they, they love Jesus, really what came across to me a lot was that, that following Jesus and being a believer had to do with what you do and what you don't do. Had to do with, with certain sets of, of, uh, of rules and do's and don'ts and they were fairly clearly defined. And then there was a time, so I grew up in this little town, 30,000 people. I was related to half of the population in that town. Yeah, there's lots more Kokoshites out there, trust me. Um, and at that point, my parents felt that God was leading them to take, to, or leading my dad to take another job about six hours away in Germany, which is literally on the other end of the country. I know it's a little weird for you guys, but it's, that's like totally out of the world if you move six hours away. And, uh, and it really rocked my world. You know, if you grow up in, in this kind of setting where your grandparents are around almost on a daily basis, your cousins are your best friends, and it, it's just, you grow up in a really protected kind of bubble. And then my parents took us out of that and moved us six hours away, which literally was an eternity. And, and so we had to fit in in a new place. We moved into a very Catholic little town where everybody but us was Catholic and very, it was very cliquish and, uh, and fitting into a new village school and It was really brutal. I was 11 years old when we moved there. And I think it really shaped me in the, in the form where, where I developed a deep, deep need to be accepted. Before that, it was a given. I was surrounded by friends and family all my life, so acceptance was a given. But when we moved down to southern Germany, you know, we spoke different. They have a very strong accent. And they, anyway, they, you made fun of a lot. And, and so I developed a deep need to, to be accepted and to fit in. I was the only church-going kid, not just in my grade, but in my school, besides my brothers and sister. And so that alienated us. And then, of all things, my parents had this huge sticker on the back of their car that said, the only hope for you, Jesus! Exclamation mark. And it went all across the back of the car that they dropped us off with at school every morning. <laughs> oh, I, I can't even tell you. I never heard the end of that. And so you try and fit in with that sticker on your parents' car. <laughs> and so sports, especially soccer, became my way in and my way to, to gain acceptance from people and to be viewed as somebody and be allowed in. And relationships, relationships with, with let's just say, romantic relationships, just a need to, to find acceptance and, and to fit in and, and be accepted became really, really central in my life. And, and, and soccer especially became the purpose, became everything I, I thrived for because that's where I received that, that pat on the shoulder and that acceptance and aff affirmation. Now, this whole time, again, I, I grew up in church. I always believed there was really never a, a time in my life where I didn't believe God was real, where I didn't believe that He loved me and, and that He was sovereign, that He had a plan for my life. And having grown up in church, I had all the right answers, and I got involved very early. And for some reason, people always, from a young age, saw in me the, the next pastor, the next, God's going to use you. And, and I never knew what to do with that when people told me that. And, um, but I got involved, involved early and got involved in a youth group. I started teaching Sunday school for the younger ones and And uh, so I got very involved, had all the right things to say. But at the same time, I, I always lived in this tension of there were these expectations at church, expectations of me personally, and then all these sets of rules that I felt like I needed to, to, to live by. And then I had my friends at school that I wanted to so badly be accepted by. And they, they did a lot of things that weren't accepted over here, not necessarily super bad things, but it just wasn't, that, that was frowned upon at least. Dancing, movies, and so on. 
but, but I wanted to fit in here. But I also believed and, and wanted to fit in here. And so it became a really deep, deep tension that, that almost tore me apart in the years to come. And there were really two major problems with, with that. The first problem I've already touched on. The first problem was that to me, really, Christianity and my value as a believer, my value as a Christian, my value in God's eyes, from my perspective, was based on my performance here. It was based on how well can I abide by these rules that are, that are expressed over here? How well can I live up to these expectations over here? I had a sense of accomplishment when I managed to, to live by them, and I had a tremendous sense of guilt when I didn't. And really, I was, I was trying at that time to live two separate lives. That's really what I was doing. I had, a, I had a Sunday life, and then I had a rest of the week life. And I remember very specifically, I, I, I was really sincere in both of those areas, <laughs> but, but they just didn't fit together. I would, when friends would, would ask me about my faith and going to church, I would tell them why I went to church and, you know, what that meant to me. And I remember one specific incident. I had talked to a friend that I had in common with my older brother about church and why I went there. And then one time I was driving in the car with my older brother, and apparently he had had a conversation with this friend of ours, and he looked at me and said, Christian, you are such a hypocrite. And I knew that, but I had never really thought about it that way. But he saw very clearly what was going on, that I was doing and saying and living one thing over here and doing and saying and living other things over here. And uh, when, he, when he said that, first of all, it stung <laughs> really deeply, but it really, for the first time, got me thinking. He said, what are you really doing? What do you believe? What are you really committed to? And I realized that I was really living quite schizophrenic, quite a schizophrenic life. But don't worry, we're okay today. Um, and I, I also realized that, that it got harder and harder to keep these two lives separate and, and to keep each one straight and, and, and away from the other. And the other thing is it, it became more and more frustrating because I couldn't truly be me in either of those two lives. There was always a sense of, of betrayal. There was always a sense of, of guilt and of dishonesty. And there was a lot of dishonesty. Because if your life turns around what other people think about you, you can't do that without lying. <laughs> you can't do that without fooling people into believing certain things about you. And during that time, I came across this verse in Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 to 16, that in connection with what my brother had already told me, really, really stung me. And it says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. This is what God says in this chapter to a church in Laodicea who, who wasn't really living for him, but wasn't really living against him. They were trying to ride the fence and, and, and live in the benefits of both worlds. And, and I knew, man, that's me. I said, that's what I'm doing. So I started to realize for the first time with this verse that the way I was living wasn't just incredibly frustrating to me, it was even more frustrating to God, whom, whom I confessed to following and, and loved. And the problem was that I really wanted to live with a for God, but I literally could not do it. I remember time and time again, sitting, thinking, thinking, I cannot live up to these expectations. I cannot do it. The, the, the desire to be accepted and, 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 and in this realm is too big. I can't do it. And you know what? I couldn't. 
Romans 7.18 talks about that. The Apostle Paul said this in Romans chapter 7. It says, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Let's read that again. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. And I was like, yes, that's me. I was like, okay, Paul struggled with this. Oh, good. I felt a lot better at that point. But I said, but, but how are we going to figure this out? At the same time, when this all kind of spiritually started brewing in my life, the, the biggest dream of my life, and I, I know I've talked about this before, and I'm, I apologize. Some of this you've heard before, I know, but it's my story. Right around this time, the biggest dream of my life, what I had pursued for years, which was a, a soccer career, came crumbling down on me at the same time. This was what I had, had put all of my effort in and all of my hopes. I think I told you before that I, I would walk home from school and in my mind already practice giving interviews after games. And, and I mean, I was into this. I was going to play professional soccer and I had my shot. I had tryouts and I was accepted on the youth team of a, of a professional team in Germany and, and came out of nowhere. It was, it was just the wildest ride. And then an injury took that away, and I've, I've got the scars from the surgery to remind me daily. Um, it, was, it was brutal. When that dream all of a sudden seemed to come true out of nowhere, and then just as suddenly came crumbling down, and that in connection with my spiritual turmoil just really brought me to the point of, of breaking. And just, just seeing, God, I know you're real. I have no idea what you're up to. I can't do what, I, what, what your word seems to expect from me. I, I can't do this anymore. And even though I know you're real and I see you, your reality in, in my father's and my parents' lives, they were really two people that were very influential in me not quitting earlier. And that was my father and a guy called Stefan. He, he is a guy that used to lead summer camps that I attended to. And, and those two, more than anybody else, when I saw their lives, and I worked with my dad for three years in his office, so I was around him on a daily basis for hours, watching their lives, I knew without the shadow of a doubt that God was real, that Jesus was real in their lives, and that somehow this life was possible and could be fulfilling. But I had come to this point at this point in my life where I said, you know what, it seems to work for them. Actually, I know it works for them. But maybe I'm just not made for this. Maybe it just doesn't work for me. But seeing my dad and seeing Stefan kept me hanging on just for a little longer. And I was 20 at this point. And there came a, a day where I said, okay, God, I know you're real. I see what my father has. I see what my mom has. I see what Stefan has. I really want that, but I've tried. And you don't seem to care <laughs> about me trying. And even though I know you're real, I will walk away from you because I can't live this double life. i got to choose one or the other, and I know I can do this one better than this. <laughs> and so I told him, I, I will walk away, knowing where that will lead, because I can't do this anymore. But I'll give you one last chance. I literally gave God an ultimatum. I don't know if that was right theologically or not. <laughs> but I said, God, I'm, I'm willing to give you the next six months. I'm done with my schooling and with my training. I worked for my dad. He had an architecture business besides being a lay pastor. And so I, I learned to be a draftsman, but that wasn't for me. And so I said, okay, I'm done with that. I, I don't know what's next, but I'm willing to give you the next six months. And I'm willing to go to this Bible school in England called Cape and Ray Hall. And I'm willing to pursue you for these next six months and, and hope that you somehow show up and show me how this is supposed to work. Because if it isn't, when I'm done with these six months, I'm done with you. I'm walking out of here. And I'm going to stop caring what my parents will think about that. I will stop caring what the church will think about it because I, I can't do this anymore. And so my father was very glad to pay for these six months of Bible school. And I went to England um, to a place that I had gone to for all these summer camps. I was very familiar with the place. And I, I, re I was really honest and sincere in my pursuit of of, of what God might have for me and how it would turn out. And it was very early on 
I think it was the second week, uh, we had a guest speaker that came in called Billy Strachan. He was from Scotland, and I don't do this very well. <laughs> a German trying to do a Scottish accent. Well, forget that. He was, he was a comedian on Scottish TV before he had an encounter with Jesus and, and gave his life to him. And he, uh, he was hilarious. I was unreal. But really deep, deep spiritual teacher. And he taught on the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he, he said this, and I'll paraphrase. He said, you know... When you go to church and you're in Christian circles, you, there's always these few people that you get around who just have this life with Jesus that seems so real and authentic and, and joyful. And, and all you can say, think is, that's what I want. Why, why don't I have that? And I was like, I, I just tell you, I, I was sitting at the edge of my seat. At the, literally, it's like, yes. Yes, and he kept describing these people and, and saying, and, and you always think, that's what I want. I was like, yes, yes. And he described how he went through that and just all he wanted to know is, how does that work? And I was sitting there, like, yes, tell me. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to tell you the secret after the break that we take. <laughs> no. And then we had a coffee break. We came back in and he said, this, okay, guys, this is the secret to this kind of life with Jesus that you see in other people and all you say is, that's what I want. He said, I can guarantee you, if you have people like that in your life, they have that life because they have surrendered their life to Jesus. They have handed controls over to him and have said, I can't do it, you do it. And I said there, that's it? <laughs> that's it? And, and so he went on to describe the difference and the, the problem that we often have in Christian circles, especially if we grew up in them. Because there's these certain traditions and, and, and ruts that we fall into. And one of them is that we, we, we push people, young people, to make this decision to pray a prayer, right? To pray a prayer to accept Jesus into your heart, and then everything is going to be great. Then you're going to live forever, and, and, and you're good to go. The problem with that is, to me at least, what, what I did unconsciously when I prayed this prayer of accepting Jesus into my life, because I knew I wasn't perfect, I needed forgiveness. I was, I think, eight years old when I prayed that prayer and asked Jesus into my life. Subconsciously, what, what I did there was, I, I got a ticket to heaven. I said, great, I prayed that prayer. Oh, cha-ching, ticket. And, and subconsciously, what I said is, thanks, Jesus. I'll see you when I get there. And, and that was it. The extent of my Christian life was, okay, I asked him for forgiveness. I'm bad, I know. Now I'm forgiven, and I'll go to heaven eventually. But it had zero bearing on my life then and there. It was a ticket to heaven, and that was it. And so what, what Billy Strachan talked about that day is, he said, Jesus doesn't just want to be the guy at the ticket counter to heaven. That's just the Savior, right? So the Bible is full of him calling, of calling him our Lord. He said, he wants to be your Lord now, here and now. Not just once you die and, and in the afterlife. He wants to live with you here and now. And he, he quoted this verse from Colossians 1.27. He said, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, the mystery to living a life with Jesus here and now, and not just waiting in expectancy to be with him once we die. The mystery, the, the, the secret to that mystery is Christ in you now, the hope of glory. It's not about what we can do for God. It's about what He wants to do in and through you here and now. See, it says Christ in you, the hope of glory. It doesn't say you for Christ, the hope of glory. And that's often how we live. What do I need to do for God so that I can live a life that pleases Him and that is acceptable to Him? See, it's not about that. It's not about what you and I can do for God. It's all about what He wants to do in your life and through your life once we've really given Him control. Man, and I walked away from that class that day thinking, wow, God, this is what I came here to, to hear. This is what I need to hear. And 
in, in defense of, of my parents and, and other believers around me. It's not that they never told me that, but you know how sometimes you have to get away from what you know to hear what you really need to know? Does that make sense? And it's just for the first time, I feel like I had an encounter with Jesus in a, a, de a spiritually defining moment that, that unraveled the secret of what it means to live with Jesus here and now. See, I had my little, my little list of things that, that I felt God should be thankful for to me. You know, I, I went to church and youth group, and I helped lead it. And, um, you know, I, I said yes to friends when they asked me if I believed in God. Say, so, hey, God, I stood up for you. Yeah, I believe in God. Yep. And I always felt, well, God should, should you know, be thankful for that. And, and I was a fairly good kid. And, but, man, for the first time, I realized that day that I had put God in this nice little niche in my life. And that niche, you know what that niche was? Where he fit in really well? That was Sunday morning. That was my God niche. Sunday morning, yep, there you go. I had all these little compartments in my life. So there was Sunday morning, and then I had all these other ones that I was in control of. And I want to illustrate that to you. I'm going to make a little drawing here. Can I, uh, can I get my easel thingy? Yeah, I'll use that. Thank you. I got it. All right. This is, this is what my life looked like. And I think this is true for a lot of us. Do you know these little plates that you get in cafeterias sometimes that have all these little compartments that I can never fit all my food into? But <laughs> um, All right. This is a plate. And please forgive me. There's a reason why I'm not on the arts team at K2. So you get all these little compartments, you know, for the mashed potatoes and beans and corn and then a little bigger for something meaty. Oh no, here goes the meat. There. All right, so you've got all these, you've got all these uh, compartments, right? And so this represented my life. So there were lots of things that were really important to me. Soccer definitely occupied this one. It probably should be bigger. And then, uh, let's just say girls. <laughs> There's always the girls, right? Didn't, isn't that what he said last week? Girls. And then there was friends, for sure. That was pretty important. Not as important as girls, but friends. Um, and then money. Didn't have much, but it was important nonetheless. And then, oh, there's God. So there was God, all right? And he had Sunday morning. I said, hey, God, this is yours here. You can have it from 10.30 till noon on, on Sunday mornings, and then maybe Friday nights for youth group. So that was, that was his niche there. And I tried to manage and control these. And boy, that didn't work really well. It just did not work very well. But that's how, how we often live our lives, as, even as followers of Jesus. This is what God has in mind. Here's the plate. You know, there's all these compartments still. There's different aspects to our life. You know, family should be in here somewhere. Family. Yeah. And uh, what I started realizing at that time in my life, that this was not acceptable to God. This just was and is not acceptable. What God wants is that He is the plate. He holds this together. This represents our lives. And He gets to choose what goes into these compartments and what priorities they have. There's nothing wrong with, with soccer. There's nothing wrong with girls. Friends, family, what, whatever it is. But what I realized is I had, this is what I had done. God wasn't satisfied with that. This is not what he created me for. This is what he created me for. And only if I'm willing to, to wipe this plate clean and say, here it is, you fill it. And you determine the priorities. You determine what goes here and here and, and, and here. See, God isn't satisfied with being a side dish. God isn't even satisfied with being the main dish. <laughs> he wants to be the one holding it all together and deciding 
what aspect, what goes into our lives and what priority they play. So I went, um, went out on a walk. This, this Bible school was in the middle of nowhere in the Lake District. An old castle had large grounds around and there was this, this little pond <laughs> that was hidden away. That's where I used to go during summer camps when I needed some alone time with somebody else. And, uh, but this time I went there, I went there by myself and Jesus. And I, I just took a walk there that afternoon and, and sat there by myself and, and, and really had this, just had this moment of saying, okay, Jesus, I, I think I get it. Or at least I think I'm beginning to get it. I, I know this, this is what you want from me. And I realize this is what I've done. And I'm willing today, Jesus, today I'm willing to wipe this plate clean and give you soccer, give you my relationships, give you the way I handle money, give you the way I handle relationships. Would you place them in here the way you want to? Would you lead me in this? It's really the first time that I know that I sincerely surrendered my life to him. And I cannot tell you, after years of guilt-driven Christianity, after years of obligation-driven Christianity, of, of living a life defined by people's expectations and my living up to that or not, I cannot express to you the freedom that I felt that day. The freedom from guilt and expectations. Now that then began a journey of continue to learning to surrender again and again. And, and areas, there's always areas in our lives that creep up where we want to grab control back. And I did this more than once and still do. But you know, the more I learn to recognize those areas and say, okay, God, okay, I, I want to take my hands back off the wheel, the easier it gets. And the more I get to experience God actually intervening in my life and seeing Him at work makes it so much easier to, to do it quicker the next day. But that's really when my journey with Jesus began. I know that Jesus was already on a journey with me, but I hadn't really been on a journey with Him. But it began that day. And it wasn't that everything all of a sudden became hunky-dory. And again, it's, it's still a daily effort to surrender my will to Him. My will in my marriage. My will in my finances. My will in how I spent my free time. My will in, in, uh, in my thought life. My will in, in my speech and the things that I say and do need to continuously be surrendered to Him. But he wants to take control of it, and he will. One verse in the Bible that really describes that kind of life that God wants from us is in Romans 12.1. It's a verse that I always had a hard time understanding until I really began to surrender my life to God. And it says this, Romans 12.1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of, service, uh, act of worship. This verse never makes sense to me, but it started to make sense when I really surrendered my life to Him. And, you know, the word sacrifice implies that it's hard, doesn't it? A sacrifice is never easy. A sacrifice is always difficult. But that's what God wants from you and me. And he wants that because he knows that he has awesome plans for you and me. But those plans can only come to, to fulfillment if we are willing to empty the plate and say, okay, God, you fill it. You do with me what you have in store. And one thing that, I've, that I'm trying to say to God constantly is, God, just as my expression of surrender, I'm willing to do anything, anytime, anywhere. You lead anything, anytime, anywhere. Part of my journey is, um, is that music has always been very important to me. Music speaks to me sometimes. God speaks to me through music more than, than other things. 
And uh, in the past, I've been very involved in music and choirs and musicals, and it, it was a big part and still is today a, a great way for me to express myself uh, to God and the way I, I communicate with God. And there's a song that became really, really important to me right at that time in my life at this Bible school in England. And one of the staff members there had written it, and it's a really cool story. He was a fairly well-known Christian songwriter in Britain at the time. His name is Andy Silver. And they were putting together a, a worship book uh, for, for churches in England. And they called him up and said, hey, a song just fell through. We're ready to print. It's alphabetically ordered. We need a song that starts with A-L-L, all. And we need it in 30 minutes to go to print. Could you whip one up? He was like, whoa, let me give it a try. And he, he wrote a song called All My Life. And it became one of the most popular songs in that book. And he, he often told me, he said, yeah, I mean, people thought, hey, you must have spent months and months meditating over the words for this song. It's so meaningful and deep. And, and, and he would always say, yeah, yeah, God gave it to me in 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> but maybe this morning... You are where, where I was back then spiritually. Maybe you're at the point where you're just so frustrated with, with wanting to live for God and, and not really knowing how to and, and, and feeling guilt and, and not accepted by God. Maybe you need to take this morning. Maybe this is the day when God's speaking to your heart and says, you know what? All you need to do is take your hands off that wheel. What did Carrie Underwood say, saying, Jesus, take the wheel? Maybe, maybe today is that day for you where you, for the first time, are willing to, to take those hands off the wheel. Maybe you're, you are at that point of frustration that I was at. Maybe you're at the point where you're ready to, to quit and walk out of this. And maybe the words to this song will, will speak to you this morning. I just want you to know Jesus isn't going to grab that wheel from you. He's waiting for you to hand it over. And I know there's some of you here who've, who've, never, who've never accepted Jesus into their life, who've never accepted that He is the Son of God and wants to be your Savior and your Lord, that He died for your sins, that He paid the price for you. And if, if you haven't, maybe today is that day for you, where you for the very first time take those hands off and say, okay, you take over completely. And then again, maybe there's some of you like me who've... who've prayed a prayer and accepted Jesus into their life and just it just hasn't really made sense in your life. It really hasn't been applicable in your life yet. And maybe the step that you need to take is to pray, God, what have I not surrendered to you? Where am I holding on? Where am I not allowing you to be Lord in my life?